Hittite Empire didn't have to collapse. Everything that it saw during the Bronze Age collapse was hazards it had seen before. Now, often we would blame the final king for being weak or otherwise flawed, but Shapililiuma II, final king of the Hittite Empire and great king at the start of Total War Pharaoh, does not seem to have been uniquely helpless in the face of history. Naturally, we would assume that in Total War Pharaoh, the player will be able to reverse the course of history, but today we're looking at the final Shipililiuma, and in large part asking about his role in the fall of the Hittite Empire, since that's our main window into his personality and competence. When Shipililiuma took the throne in about 1207 BCE, just two years before the start of the game, he could see three main problems on his plate. Every border, except the border with Egypt, was being pushed on by a hodgepodge of groups. The famous Sea Peoples on one hand, but also folks from Greece, the North Anatolian Cascans, the people of the Caucasus, and the desert tribes usually lumped together as Habiru and Amorites, were all being displaced in part by famine, and in part by other population movements that were themselves driven by famine, and in part because of opportunism from the various chaos that they could see. These all had the potential to overrun the empire. Then, that same famine affecting the peoples of Europe and the North was affecting Anatolia as well. The Egypt-Hittite friendship had allowed the negotiation of various grain shipments to be sent north, which surely helped to a certain extent, but it was simply impossible for the Bronze Age international trade system to make a significant dent in the kind of volume of hunger that was being felt by Anatolia as a whole, probably kept the capital city doing well. And finally, ever since Hattusili III had deposed his nephew 70 years previously, the great kings in the Hittite capital had suffered an acute lack of legitimacy, with a rival branch of the family in Tarhuntasha having attempted to seize control only a few years prior. Other branches of the family ruled near-independent fiefdoms in Aleppo and Karchemish, and of course, the always feisty Western lords were threatening yet again to break away. Facing all of this, it's perhaps no surprise that Shapililiuma didn't actually want to be king when his older brother died in 1207. During his coronation, he actually apologizes for taking the throne, stating, The people of Hatti rebelled against my brother Arnawanda but I have never offended against him. If he had any offspring, I would not have replaced him. I would rather have protected his offspring. Because he had no children, I asked whether there was a pregnant wife among his harem, but there was not even a pregnant wife. And now Arnawanda has left no descendants. I have done everything I could to avoid offending the royal family in making myself lord. Never mind that child kings and regents weren't really a thing in the Hittite Empire, Shapililiuma was even looking for any pregnant concubines in order for him to escape the kingship. But it seems that his brother had been shooting blanks, and there was just no avoiding it. That said, his initial reluctance doesn't seem to have translated into any inability to execute the role of king with the full required gusto. The documentation for his reign is spotty, so it's hard to tell what order things happened in, but it does seem like first in line was a round of loyalty oaths, enforced on all the many vassals in the empire. Loyalty specifically to Shapililiuma and his sons, not to any other royal branch that might be floating around out there ready to take control. If he was going to be king, he just wasn't going to tolerate anybody running around behind his back. Second priority is to arrange what was likely the last set of grain shipments from Egypt to feed the Hittite capital. This shipment wouldn't be the last because it wasn't needed afterwards. Oh no, 
it was still very much needed, but because the death of Merneptah saw his successors far less interested in things like international trade and more interested in internal feuding. Take a look at the other videos in this playlist, link in the description, to hear about the death of Merneptah and all the feuding that followed that. Now we actually have these receipts that have survived 3,000 years from this grain shipment, telling us that it passed through the Canaanite city of Ugarit, then reached Anatolia via the port of Ura in Tarhantasha, and from there into Hattusha, telling us that whatever the state of rivalry between Hattusha and Tarhantasha, there was at least a certain amount of willingness to permit trade, at least for these particular years. Perhaps Kurunta in Tarhantasha was waiting to see what kind of man Shapiliuma turned out to be before resuming hostilities. But following this shipment, Anatolia would be on its own, largely cut off not only from external grain supplies, but also international trade more broadly, from which the Hittites had formerly got also a good amount of tin and textiles. Now, part of the reason international trade collapsed was because the roads just weren't safe anymore. And this pretty quickly becomes a major problem. Shapiliuma's father, Tudhalia, had conquered the island of Cyprus, a crucial source of copper for the kingdom. But it appears to have fallen mostly or completely out of Hittite control by this point, because it's been overrun by the early waves of sea peoples. In order to get control back, Shapiliuma takes an unprecedented step for the Hittite Empire. He wages three naval battles. That's on the water, so not featured in Total War Pharaoh, to clear out the Sea Peoples. Then he fights another battle on land to confirm his control over the island. Now, up until this point, the Hittite Empire has been exclusively a land-based kingdom. We don't even hear about the kingdom having its own boats until Shibiliuma's father built, or perhaps bought, the transport fleet that brought the army to Cyprus in the first place. And now here they are, battling away on the high seas. This could well have been the inauguration of a new chapter in Hittite history, one which saw them competing more directly for trade and land throughout the Mediterranean and even having better access to the Black Sea. Except, of course, for the fact that they're maybe a decade away from collapse at this point, so none of that's ever gonna pan out. Fully aware of his dire straits, Shapililiuma takes a moment of calm to set his house in order. His father's burial had apparently been hasty and chaotic, and a good deal of finishing remained to be done on the funerary monument. Also, Shapililiuma turns at this point to the gods more generally. Though it isn't clear if he's increasing his worship and his patronage of the gods in accordance with, or in opposition to, his grandmother's religious reforms of a few decades prior. Still, while burying his father properly was a decent thing to do, neither the ancestors nor the divines stepped in to help the empire in this hour. Now, remember those loyalty oaths that Shapililiuma had demanded upon taking the throne? Now, those weren't sent via Twitter, instantly communicating with the whole world. It took time for a message to be drafted. It took time for the messengers to cross the hills and the mountains of Anatolia. It took time for the vassals to draft their own submission oaths. It took even more time for the vassals to gather an appropriate tribute offering, especially given the poor economy. And then it took even longer for the heavily laden messenger, now leading a slowly winding caravan of carts to return to the capital. And so it only now started to become apparent that a good number of supposed vassals had simply decided not to offer that submission this time around. We have letters from the city of Ugarit, a town of Canaanite culture on the modern-day Syrian coast, where Shapililiuma is reiterating his demands for submission, apparently without satisfaction. We have indicators from the western vassals, likely already beset by invaders from Greece, 
and not necessarily Greeks themselves, the Greeks were themselves being invaded. So some of the invaders were people fleeing from Greece, but some of these invaders may have also been people from the Balkans, north of Greece, who at the same time they were going into Greece, some of them were also coming into Anatolia. But these Western vassals were not paying attention to the wider empire. They were busy with somebody. But the king couldn't be everywhere at once, and he didn't have the resources to split up his army. He fought against Tarhantasha, and though we have no details about why or how, we can assume that Karunta, as well, was neglectful of his proper submission to the Hittite great king, having been a rebel for a couple decades at this point, possibly, depending on how you put Tudhalia's chronology together. He fought in Isua, which was a critical border region in the eastern mountains, separating the Hittites from Assyria. And of course, you don't want the Assyrians sneaking up on your back while you're dealing with all these other issues. And he also fought a pretty massive campaign in southwest Anatolia, in the Luca lands, the area which would classically become Lycia, against what seems to be both rebel vassals and foreign invaders at the same time. And he may have been victorious in all three of these campaigns. But ultimately, Shapilaliuma was facing a situation not unlike a zombie movie. He could defeat one threat after another. He was competent, the army was still kind of strong, but eventually the weight of bodies just overwhelms the hero. We don't hear anything directly about the fall of the Hittite Empire from the Hittites. None of the writings survived if anyone even bothered to write it down. But from archaeology and neighboring kingdoms, we see that external threats overwhelm region after region, defenses badly weakened by lack of imperial unity, famine, and the sheer mass of the often poorly understood migrant armies coming in. Finally, the ultimate date is not well known. It could have been as early as 1190, perhaps 1180 or 1177. But whatever the date, the Hittite Empire was reduced to scattered, disconnected holdings, and the capital of Hattusha was isolated. The Cascans, the great northern barbarian enemy for all of Hittite history, were heading south and no one knew where the king's army was, or if it even still lived from wherever it had been sent out. Shapilaliuma and his royal household had nothing around them but a small bodyguard and no way to defend the city. And so they simply walked out the gate one day, perhaps hoping to meet up with the remnants of the army, or perhaps hoping to gain refuge in the formerly loyal cities of Aleppo or Carchemish, Seeing the king walk out, the nobles packed up their goods and walked out as well. The abandonment was calm, or at least relatively so, and as the rich left, so too did most of the poor as well. The whole process took perhaps a few weeks, and the capital city of one of the great powers of the Bronze Age was simply emptied out, knowing that nothing good remained in that once accursed place. Perhaps a month later, the Cascans arrived to a ghost town. The few who had stubbornly remained were cut down where they stood. The city was plundered of what little wealth had been left behind, and the Cascans, centuries-long enemies of the Hittites, burned Hattusha to the ground, ending the Hittite Empire. We don't know when, where, or how Shapilaliuma died. Some imagine he died in the wilderness, victim of some random pedestrian banditry in that chaotic time. Some think he found a degree of refuge in a loyal city. Some think he put troops together in a heroic but ultimately futile last stand. Having put in an honest effort to rule, it seems unlikely that he failed to acquit himself nobly in his final hours. We can ultimately look on him as having done a solid best during the hardest possible situation, or we can look on with scorn for him 
having failed to rebuild the empire from nothing, as his ancestors had done four or five times previously. An alternate history Hittite empire in the Iron Age, entirely plausible, contending with the Assyrians, Persians, and Greeks, is a remarkable place to contemplate, but it no doubt would have featured a good many kings named Shippililiuma after the man who, in our real history, did not quite manage to keep his head above water. In terms of Total War Pharaoh, he is perhaps the character with the most predictable starting situation. He is in Hattusha. He's surrounded by many nominal allies, but just as many rebels. And I haven't seen any previews, haven't come out for him as I put this episode together. I'm just saying there's no flexibility here like there is for a lot of the Egyptian and Canaanite characters. Anyway, food and manpower should be a constant struggle for him. But a player who gets out ahead of the local situation and really solidifies his base if, that's the, if you manage that, there's going to be a real game in beating back the incoming invaders while expanding the empire. Now, unless they show off something really neat and unexpected with Corunta, Shapililiuma is going to be my first campaign, which I fully expect not to win. But next time, we'll round out our look at the leaders of Total War Pharaoh with Corunta. And until then, we bid farewell. To my son, Tabarna, great king, king of Hatti, mighty hero, Shapililiuma, son of Tudhalia. Thank you for watching.